Log on, tune in, find out. Another good idea from Cambridge. So, so we talked almost everything about the LMF. I shall try to, to say something. Half the same things from a little bit different angle. Even the pictures are already known to you, but the number of pictures, unfortunately, is limited. But it's interesting to know that some of them were made by Lemaitre himself. He almost always carried with him a little camera and took a lot of pictures. Um, unfortunately, after his death, uh, the majority of his photographs and his documents and his papers, manuscripts, were destroyed simply. And it was Gordon, Gordon Godard who prevented to, the, to be destroyed all them. So only a couple of pictures have been preserved. Calculation that he never read 
uh, letters from Hilbert. And <laughs> uh, in fact, Hilbert, a uh, few months ago, learned from Einstein, who was in Göttingen and had a lecture uh, about the problem. And uh, he approached the problem from the mathematical point of view. Um, and um, he was the first, in fact, to, to discover uh, Einstein's equations, although he did not appreciate fully the his, his, his physical meaning. And Hilbert noticed that there are two uh, non-regular, this, this name non-regular comes from, from, from Hilbert himself, but strangely enough, a great mathematician did not capture the difference between genuine singularity and the one arising from the inappropriate choice of the coordinate system. It is a sign of the fact that uh, the singularity problem is a very malicious one. Uh, from the very beginning, it was involved in many both conceptual and, uh, and mathematical uh, problems. Einstein was very unhappy with the Schwarzschild solution because it presented a well-defined structure of space-time due to a single body. And in his view, this contradicted Max principle. As uh, it's very well known, uh, the ideology which um, Einstein read <coughs> of uh, science of mechanics by, by Mach uh, was a great inspiration for Einstein uh, when he created <coughs> general relativity. And uh, by Mach's principle, Einstein understood the doctrine that, um, mm. roughly speaking, space type should be generated by the distribution, the global distribution of masses in the universe. And uh, the structure solution, solution seems to contradict that ideology because uh, it possessed a very well defined structure, space time structure, due to a single body. And Einstein believed after Mach, that if, if we have the universe with a single body, this single body should have no mass, because the mass is induced, induced to a given body from the distribution of all other masses in the universe. Einstein dissatisfaction with the Max principle problem uh, grew even more when, in 1917, Willem Descartes. <coughs> a uh, Dutch uh, mathematician and astronomer published a new solution to these equations. And this the solution represented the empty universe. It was against the Max principle. Uh, and this anti-Machian situation was not acceptable for Einstein. And Einstein argued that there was a great um, discussion between uh, Einstein and, um, and Desiter. Several papers were published by both of them. Uh, we can admire the speed of publication uh, at that time. It was more time, 1917. And Einstein, I think, if I remember, published this paper, uh, the first cosmological paper in March. And in May issue, uh, as it already presented his answer to that. Probably, uh, not probably, it's true that uh, Desiter knew uh, Einstein, um, Einstein work from, from the manuscript Einstein sent from the, to him. And Einstein argued against Desiter's solution that uh, he said that in the coordinates used by Desiter, there are two non regular points in the Desiter solution. Again, at the beginning of the coordinate system and at that distance. And Einstein claimed that the first of these singularities uh, can be removed by the change of coordinates. But the second is truly disastrous for the Desiter solution, and uh, this solution should be rejected. In this way, uh, Einstein tried to save Max's principle. Uh, as we know today, it's just opposite. Uh, well, and, and exactly here, Lemaitre enters the stage. The first Lemaitre published paper, the, the first in the field of cosmology or general relativity, is this one. Note on the Citer Universe, it's published in Journal of Mathematics and Physics. Uh, this journal was published by the uh, Massachusetts Institute of Technology, and I, as far as I know, it does not exist anymore. 
In both coordinate systems, those used originally by Desitar and later on by Eddington, the universe is static and its space is spherical with positive curvature. Lemaitre introduced new coordinates in which the universe is not sta non static, it expands, and space is Euclidean. Here we have a uh, very beautiful picture. Uh, Space-time, which is an invariant structure, uh, in the Sitter model is this hyperboloid. And in original uh, the Sitter coordinates, uh, this uh, space-time was decomposed into time, which was uh, the axis of symmetry, and perpendicularly uh, <coughs> spaces, local instantaneous spaces, which were spherical. Uh, in in uh, Lemaitre's uh, coordinates, uh, the, the space -like slices are like that. They are Euclidean and go to in both ways, in both ways to, to, to infinity. Uh, new coordinates clearly display the homogeneous and isotropic structure of the desktop world, and uh, all these points here are on equal footing and the central singularity disappears. Uh, and there is also no mass horizon. Um, the mass horizon was uh, invented by Eddington when he analyzed the Sitter original solution. He claimed that it's not empty, but uh, at the second singularity, there is a kind of accumulation of masses, uh, but uh, as shown in, in this paper by Lemet, uh, it is a um, byproduct of the uh, choice of Coordinates. It is interesting to read Lemaitre's comments uh, on, on, on his own work. Uh, he commented on uh, the non static character of the Desitter world and on the ze zero curvature, the flatness of space in the Desitter uh, world. Uh, Lemaitre quotes Eddington, who says that it is sometimes argued. Uh, against Desitter world that it becomes non-static as soon as any matter is inserted in it. But this property is perhaps rather in favor of Desitter theory than against it. And Lemaitre uh, comments uh, that in the following way, our treatment evidences this non-static character of Desitter world, which gives a possible interpretation of the mean preceding motion of spiral <coughs> nebula. So it is a uh, Scheme that he was interested uh, in uh, this gradual motions of, of nebula. Uh, and he says uh, this is rather in favor of the solution. But the second problem, the zero curvature, uh, is a compromising property of the Desiter universe. Uh, the space is Euclidean flat and extends to infinity. And he says, this property is completely inadmissible. Uh, with this property, we are led back to the Euclidean space and to the impossibility of filling up an infinite space with matter which cannot be, uh, be finite. The Sitter solution has to be abandoned, not because it is not static, but because it does not give a finite space without introducing an impossible boundary. So we see how important role prejudices are, uh, are, are played in, in cosmology or in general in science. I remember um, Weinberg in his three minutes, um, first three minutes wrote a very remarkable sentence that uh, it's no problem not to have prejudices, but the problem is to have correct ones. <laughs> <laughs> Uh, the idea of a closed universe belongs to, uh, to the Met's deeply rooted philosophical prejudices. Of course, it was suggested to him by first Einstein uh, cosmological work in which uh, the space was closed, compact. Uh, Einstein uh, selected such a topology in order to avoid problems with the boundary conditions at infinity. And uh, this uh, idea influenced a lot of cosmologists at that time. It is interesting that in the first period um, of uh, general relativity, 
uh, almost exclusively closed spaces were, were investigated. Uh, in his seminar years, when he studied for the priesthood, uh, as we know from the league already, Einstein wrote an essay entitled La Physique d'Einstein. Uh, and uh, in this uh, essay, he expressed the view that the space had to be finite, since otherwise it would be uh, not accessible to the human mind. Uh, I think that um, one can see in this view some traces of his Neotomis doctrine, uh, to which Young Lament was exposed at the University of Louvain. Uh, and according to this doctrine, actual infinity is a self-contradictory. Therefore, matter could not be actually infinite. And if space is infinite, then uh, and matter finite, then we would have an inadmissible boundary. And he objected against that. And this was view which uh, uh, cherished to the end of his life. Uh, for the title of his conference at the Catholic Institute in Paris in 1950, uh, he chose Universal problem accessible à la science humaine. Uh, the universal the problem accessible, accessible for the human science. And one of the conditions of this accessibility was a finance space. This is a well, side remark, remarks, but it of course I think very interesting. This is about desert resolution, but Lennon played also an important role in solving the enigma of the Schwanschel singularities. And the problem was present already in his doctoral thesis presented to the Massachusetts Institute of Technology. We heard from Dominique about that. But later on, and he was never published, but later on, in 1933, Lennart published a very important paper, Liber en Expansion, which never was translated into English, and it is one of the most important cosmological papers by Lennart. It is pure, almost pure mathematics. There are very nicely elaborated mathematical problems plaguing uh, the early cosmology. Um, and uh, at the end, the last section of this paper uh, is about the singularity. And he writes that Einstein su suggested to him, uh, uh, no, not, not Einstein, sorry. It is not in the last uh, section. Uh, the, problem, the, the problem was suggested to him by Eddington. Namely, uh, Eddington noticed that Einstein equations for a homogeneous spherically symmetric perfect fluid was solved by Schwarz Schwarzschild. Uh, it's known today as an interior Schwarzschild solution. And uh, uh, Eddington claimed that the problem could be badly posed since density uh, is not coordinate independent in the quantity. And Lennart uh, took over this problem and he uh, and he um, defined uh, invariant uh, quantity uh, composed of density and pressure. This is this quantity. This the row and the density and the P for pressure. And this comes from the fact that uh, PowerPoint, at least my version, is not device independent. And this is why I decided to omit this uh, accent, French accent or I in the next name because uh, various beautiful pictures appear. <coughs> So Lemaitre uh, defined uh, this invariant uh, quantity in, in, in units in which speed of light is equal one, uh, and found a solution which, for small densities, approximated the Schwarzschild solution. He then considered, and uh, it was uh, not homogeneous this solution found by by Lemaitre. And he then considered the case when the fluid is well inhomogeneous but of constant invariant density, this one, and produced the solution, which today is known as tolman bondi solution. Uh, well, and um, Lemaitre, 
in this work qualified this newly found solution as probable mountain value, probably new one. In fact, it was obtained in 1922 by Marcel Bruyant with the help of different methods. And as special cases of this solution, uh, uh, the method obtained Einstein Static Universe and Desiter Empty Universe from the early Thomas Later on, this suggested to him an idea that there must be a solution which is intermediate, interpolated among these two solutions. And in this way, he found, uh, he computed all the uh, solutions to Einstein equations now attributed to Prima. And in the course of this work, uh, Lenet found a coordinate system in which the singularity at this distance from the beginning to end uh, disappears and there remains the central singularity of the only real uh, strong curvature singularity in the Schwarzschild solution. In this way, he solved the problem of uh, singularity. And Einstein himself was extremely unhappy uh, with the existence of singularities and had an idea that the appearance of singularities is due to the assumption of the spatial isotropy. And he claimed that if we get rid of the assumption of the isotropy and when, when we compress not isotropic uh, configuration of matter, then uh, perhaps can go to, uh, to the expansion without any similar points. And uh, he discussed uh, this problem with Lenet and suggested to him a simple anisotropic metric, today known as Bianchi 1 metric, uh, with an advice to him to compute the corresponding work model to see whether they think, and to see just he, he believed that singularity will disappear. And uh, this is uh, the last section of this 1933 uh, Lenet paper. Lemaitre confesses in that paper that he had no difficulty in computing this model, but it turned out, strangely enough, that the singularity continues to exist. Even more, it is evident from his calculations that the tendency to, to produce singularity in that kind of metric is even stronger than in the case of uh, the isotropic uh, distribution structure. And uh, at the end, he comments, the Lemaitre comments that the above is not a formal proof of the impossibility to avoid zero volume by anisotropy, because the form of the metric which was assumed is not the most general imaginable. But this indicates, after all, in a quite general case, that anisotropy acts in the opposite direction. So he developed an idea that uh, singularities are not easy uh, avoidable in uh, general relativity. What is very interesting that if we look at the calculations made by the Met, we spot a certain uh, inequality which plays an important role in, in his uh, argument. Uh, and this um, inequality uh, reappeared in the proofs of singularity theorems in the 60s by Hawking, Penrose, and others, and it's known as uh, energy condition. Uh, it is a special case of the energy condition uh, used later on in proving similarity theorems. But the point is, the important point is that uh, from now on, Lemaitre knew that singularities are not easy available. And now we have two from logarithmic infinity to the primeval atom. This I can be brief because homozo is already known to us. This is the Daniels paper uh, on 1927. Uh, well, uh, I agree with uh, Dominique that uh, here we have for the first time an explanation of redshifts, but in I think we have even a little bit more in this paper. Namely, for the first time, uh, Lemaitre 
tried to make comparisons between the predictions of his model with actual measurements of the uh, red shifts. This is the page from, from this paper uh, with his empirical data and his calculations. And uh, so it was the first paper uh, in a relativistic cosmology in which theory was confronted with observational data. This is, this is which makes this paper historically extremely important. Uh, this was two years before Hubble discovered, discovered uh, this, his law. Uh, this is the picture taken from uh, Hubble's uh, famous book on the real of the nebula uh, with uh, empirical data and, uh, and his law here. We see that the dispersion of observational data is quite pronounced. And here is a, a recent uh, diagram, and this little spot here represents all this square here. So we are now much better acquainted with the universe and the structure than many others of magnitude. solutions to Einstein equations. Uh, so in my, we have found in the among the papers left by Remet a red path. And in this red path there were some hand calculations by Lemet. They were proofs of his article of 1927, which we saw uh, during the morning lecture. And uh, there was uh, this um, diagram showing all uh, solutions to to Einstein equations with, uh, so to speak, with an uh, not perfect, but ordinary uh, cosmological principle. At that time, the, this name was not used. It was simply a, a assumption of isotropic homogeneity. <coughs> we have uh, uh, all the three month LMF, we can call them solutions. Here we have three classes. Uh, curvature, positive curvature of space, zero curvature of space, uh, negative curvature of space. Uh, Friedman uh, wrote two papers, 1922 and 1924, uh, and he computed in the first of these papers, he computed all these models with, uh, with positive curvature of space time. <coughs> um, so he found all these solutions. In two days, years later, he published a paper with negative uh, of space. Strangely enough, he never considered, never published, except the new uh, this is a little bit flat uh, space. Um, probably he, he considered that self evident. Uh, uh, Lemaitre, as we discussed with Dominique today, Probably starting from his doctor uh, thesis in Massachusetts uh, Institute of Technology, he knew all these solutions. But um, uh, uh, in, in his red path, where were these sol were the solutions? Uh, these ones only. And uh, he selected uh, to, to compare the um, theory with observational data, this model. Uh, let's let's look at it a bit closer. This uh, this is cosmological constant. Uh, it has a distinguished value, which is called here uh, lambda e Einstein. This value was adopted by Einstein, and it is necessary to have a static solution here, which never expands or contracts. And this is only valid for the very special choice of the value of cosmological constant. And um, with this constant, with Einstein value con uh, this constant, but uh, with a little bit different initial conditions, we have this asymptotic or logarithmic solution, which uh, has no singularity but expands forever and goes to the decimal empty universe. Why um, uh, Lemaitre decided to choose this model? There was no singularity. At that time, he was not yet aware that the singularity cannot be easily avoided. <coughs> It was 1927, and he computed that in 1933. So, and the second problem was the problem of the age of the universe. 
which at that time uh, the observation of from data of the, from observational data was uh, seems to, to be much longer than from the, from the expansion of the universe. So uh, it was reasonable to have the model without uh, the emission of the singularity. Well, uh, and but uh, he was happy with this solution for a short period of time because uh, we know already the, the origin of his idea of um, ideal atom. This is uh, the Benio's address to the British Association for Advancement of Science by Eddington. We know already the content of that. The uh, elementary Eddington said that the universe uh, space of the universe is closed, but, uh, but um, uh, time is open and if we go back, we, we go to the beginning uh, of the minimum entropy and so this, this sentence was quoted today a couple of times philosophically the notion of the beginning uh, of ages of to And uh, as we know, uh, Matt answered this note Let's, let's, let's take a look at, uh, at, the, at the title. This is the end of the world from the standpoint of the mathematical physics. And here the title is the beginning of the world from the point of the view of quantum theory. So there's a paradise between the titles. And he says that Sir Arthur Eddington states that philosophically the notion of the beginning of the present order of nature is the pattern to be. I would rather be inclined to think that the present state of quantum theory suggests a beginning of the world very different from the present order of nature. Thermodynamical principles from the point of view of quantum theory may be stated as follows. Close. One, the energy of constant total amount is distributed in discrete quanta. Second, the number of distinct quanta is ever increasing. And if we go back in the course of time, we must find fewer and fewer quanta until we find that all the energy of the universe packed in a few or even in one in it. <coughs> this is the final answer. So, uh, having an idea of medieval atom, the uh, Lemet had to change his view on the evolution of the universe. And he selected this model. This model also is with the value close to uh, the value of, cosmo of Einsteinian value of cosmological constant. And uh, if uh, that uh, lambda is equal to lambda e, then we have a static universe. And uh, if it's a little bit bigger, then we have this quasi static period in the middle. And uh, if we take a bigger, even bigger value of, of lambda, then this period is quasi static can be made as long as we wish. And so this gave uh, great flexibility to uh, to uh, in make, introducing the in concordance with the uh, theory of empirical data as far as uh, the problem of the universe is concerned. And about that, uh, we he wrote the following, the radius of space can, be st can start from zero. Such a singular event, which arises when space has a zero volume, is a bottom of space-time. This is a very often used expression, bottom of space-time, which terminates every line of space-time. We should uh, uh, notice here the following thing. When uh, Lemaitre spoke about the primeval atom, as we have this morning, he usually considered the primeval atom as very small from the cosmological point of view, but never zero. But when he treated the problem from a mathematical point of view, he says about the zero, uh, starting from zero. And in a very more modern way, he treats space-time which terminates at every, uh, which terminates, the space-time singularity terminates every line of space-time. This is a very modern uh, uh, formulation because today we define mathematically classical singularities at, as those regions in which 
all histories of particles and photons, that is to say, space like the time like and zero uh, geodesics terminate. So the uh, space uh, singularity is not a point or place in space time, it is a kind of edge, a boundary at which all histories of particles and photons terminate. And uh, we treat that <coughs> as a criteria of whether the space time is a singular or not. Uh, if uh, we can prolong uh, all histories of particles, photons, indefinitely, there is no singularity. But with, with the proviso that prolong, we should understand the special uh, geometric character. Uh, we must speak about geodesic completeness, but I shall not go into the states. And if at least one uh, history uh, ends suddenly, then we meet uh, singularity. So uh, he had a good intuition uh, here. And he was used to say that uh, singularity is a geometric <coughs> support of primeval. So we see that his work in mathematics inspired him in, in his uh, thinking about uh, physics or, or well and, and vice versa. So it was a kind of feedback. <coughs> and now the next point cosmology. Uh, Lemaitre was one of the first cosmologists, if simply not the first one, who included quantum physics into a cosmological model. It was not yet a quantum gravity theory, but the primeval atom certainly was a quantum object. Uh, and, uh, well, we know already everything uh, from the, this morning talks, but uh, perhaps a little bit different angle. In the classical view, the same deterministic laws <coughs> that are able to predict the future could also be employed to compute more remote conditions from which the initial conditions of the present universe may have evolved. Therefore, it is difficult to understand how the initial conditions could really have been a beginning. We can al always choose something which is out of which these initial conditions should evolve. And there is, this is Lemaitre Wright's essential one of Kant's antinomies, the antinomy about the beginning of the universe. And he says such an antinomy is valid as far as we remain in the context of classical physics. But if we uh, go to quantum mechanics situation, it changes drastically. Any physical system, uh, and therefore the universe as well, is described by an assembly of potential states which can be or not to be occupied. And the most probable distribution is that of equal occupation of all possible states. Since the entropy is a measure of the total number of individual energy packets, we may say that the final state is the one with the maximum entropy. And conversely, a state of minimum entropy would be a state in which energy is condensed into a few packs, packets as possible. Uh, this state is called the primeval atom and can be regarded as the physical beginning of the universe. So we see that the uh, applied and general principles of quantum mechanics to cosmology. Uh, the subsequent evolution is not encoded in this initial state. It is not like in phonograph when everything is encoded in, in the disk. A classical determinism does not stand anymore. Uh, these are almost uh, words of the matter. I believe that initial conditions need not have the same degree uh, of freedom as has the universe that has evolved from them. Events progress with energy being split into more and more distinct packets. From the same beginning, very different universes can evolve. From the same beginning, various evolutions can follow. When the number of individual pockets becomes very large, the essential indeterminacy ceases to be effective and is gradually replaced by determinist 
characteristic for macroscopic phenomena. So mm, uh, only when we have a big number of uh, physical units, so to speak, then uh, everything from one to the world is being averaged and uh, we have classical physics. Uh, standard quantum mechanics, which uh, the matter applied to cosmology, does not pose the question of quantizing space time. This was one of the questions this morning. But at this point, Lemaitre goes beyond standard quantum mechanics. And he assumes <coughs> that space time and time are intrinsically statistical concepts. Of course, it is also borrowed from, from thermodynamics. Consequently, we cannot ascribe to them any physical meaning before one has a sufficient uh, number of physical individuals. We should remember that his vision was the following. We have the primeval atom, it splits into fragments. This fragment split into more fragments, and uh, the multiplicity is growing. Uh, in his view, space and time emerge from the simple initial state as the process of energy polarization or progresses. And he writes, the beginning of multiplicity really means the beginning of the very uh, meaning of uh, any notion which uh, involves a great number of individual space and time are such notions which involve a great number of individuals. It stands just before the beginning of space and time, which requires progressively a meaning where multiplicity is increased enough. So uh, in the beginning, the beginning is a temporal and a special special because there is no space and no time. Uh, and uh, well, <coughs> it's quite the modern view that on, on the time level there's no time and no space in the, in the current understanding of these terms. Uh, he never speaks about quantization of space time, but in fact, it is some presentiment of that here. Um, as space and time are uh, the indispensable <coughs> tools of any physical notion, uh, it stands just before physics. Physics is born together with space and time. Today we would be inclined to say that we have some physics before space and time. Space and time are not necessary conditions for, for physics to be all these present theories and uh, theory, uh, theory. They are looking for physics before we have ordinary space and time. <coughs> it was, as I said, a, 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 a grant for physics. And this grant for the was indeed inaccessible. Today, various models of quantum gravity <coughs> offer a wide field of speculations for the birth of space and time. But uh, we see that, at least qualitatively, uh, our present ideas are, well, in, in some sense, in agreement with the next view. Very roughly speaking, of course. Uh, in modern view, quantum gravity <coughs> regime should remove the initial singularity from the future of the universe. This is our hope. Our hope. For, for the net, on the other hand, the initial singularity in Friedman's cosmological models gives a natural geometric support for his primeval atom hypothesis. He writes, the radius of space can start from zero, such a singular event which arises when space is zero volume is at the bottom of space time, which terminates every line of space time. We, we already know that. And, uh, quotation. <coughs> and we may speak of this event, this atemporal event, as of a beginning. I do not say a creation. Physically, it is a beginning in that sense that if something that has happened before, it has no observable, observable influence on the behavior of the universe. This is a quotation from, sorry, from uh, the Japanese encyclopedia paper. Uh, we have found with Laudon Godard among papers written by the Met, a manuscript quite an extensive manuscript, I think about, if I remember, about 40 pages or longer, in which he gave a summary of his um, 
of his cosmological views. Uh, probably, we tried to, to find out uh, the origin of this paper. It was never published. Uh, probably he was uh, ordered by a, some a Catholic encyclopedia pub, which was supposed to be published in Japan before the war. Because uh, on the first page of this manuscript, the man wrote Japanese encyclopedia. <laughs> but then the war started, and probably uh, that paper was never sent to be published, and it remains in but uh, from the philosophical point of view, it's, uh, there are many interesting comments. Some of them are very similar to uh, those published uh, in the Solvay Conference. But the paper was certainly earlier before the Solvay Conference. Okay? And uh, here it's only just uh, a few words about his uh, religious views that we discussed that this morning. So I, I speak that. He said that uh, such a concept of a natural beginning uh, remains entirely outside any metaphysical or religious question. He can materially free to deny any transcendental being, and for the believer, it removes any attempt to familiarity with God. If you were that you are going already quoted and understood now, and to that Jesus finger. It is consonant to the wording of Isaiah's meaning of the physical skin in the beginning of creation. Something to think. Perhaps we will discuss that tomorrow, so I will want to show the picture that nowadays observation of observation of the most distant type I one I hate. Uh, supernova shows that uh, that the universe is accelerating. Uh, this is the end of the problem with our matter, our energy, and so forth. And so, um, as uh, when, when the observational data from, from uh, supernova accumulate, it is more and more evident that uh, the best fit to this data is the following model. This one. So it, it starts probably with something which well, we say that time, time threshold is great with question mark here. And then there's acceleration slowing down. This is a quasi-static period. And there are three possibilities that collapse and the accelerations again. Uh, that version of the model, the most hard flavor of today. Uh, and um, manipulate, this is with cosmological constant, and with manipulating, manipulating with the cosmological constant, we can prolong this polystatic uh, period. And this is the best fit to the present data. And we recognize in that element solution. Is this just a uh, by chance that is agreeing uh, with the predictions, or there is some deeper reason. I think that there might be a deeper reason because uh, the match needed uh, this quasi-static period not only in order to make a con uh, concordance with the long uh, age of the universe, but also he needed that for the um, processes leading to the formation of galaxies and cluster of galaxies. He needed such a period in which uh, in which the uh, expansion is not disturbing the process of, of collapsing of matter into the, some local structures. And he did a lot of work, both numerical and also theoretical, about, in the later part of his life, about uh, this gravitational instability leading to, uh, to the formation of clusters of galaxies and galaxies. So he needed to that period, and it's not impossible that for the same reason we, we, we would like to have uh, this, uh, this what is that part of the model. This is the same picture in a different style with the Big Bang expansion slowing down and, and again and acceleration. In 1931, there was in British Association 
Soviet Association for the Advancement of Science, a discussion devoted to the evolution of the universe. And all prominent cosmologists of that time, astronomers and geologists, were present at that discussion. And in the supplement to Nature, uh, there is a well, the report uh, of, of that, uh, of that um, meeting. And at the end of the meeting, James Jeans said the following. Suppose some infallible oracle offer, offers to give us yes or no answers to two scientific questions for each of us. Personally, I think I might chose as my two questions the following. First, does the main energy of stellar radiation come from the annihilation of matter? And the second, is the universe expanding at about the rate indicated by the spectra of the nebula? Well, it's interesting which questions we would follow. <laughs> the next speaker was George Lemesh. And he said, if I had to ask a question of him to the infallible oracle, alluded to by Sir James Jeans, I think I should choose this. Has the universe ever been oppressed or did the expansion start from the beginning? Is the model from 1927 or 31 correct? But I think I would ask the oracle not to give the answer in order that the subsequent generation would not be deprived of the level of second form and of finding the solution. So thank you, Monsignor Jolimet, <laughs> for your generosity, only to which we have something to, 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 to research, to investigate. And I think we should also promise our successors not to solve everything, but rather to give something to them, not to claim that we have solved everything. Thank you. is infinite or finite? In what discipline do we search for an answer to that question? Is it a cosmological question or is it a philosophical question? It's a good question. <laughs> <laughs> uh, I would say perhaps in the following way that we would like to have it a cosmological question. But uh, in fact, it depends how we define 
cosmological and metaphysical question. Because, you know, let, let's take uh, as an example our present view that the universe is flat. So we have uh, no, uh, no vestiges of curvature to the horizon. But we have no warranty that behind the horizon uh, the universe starts to, to curve. And this will be, I think, always like that. We can also on, only broaden our horizons. And to say that within our horizon, space is, is flat or, or within the arrows of our mind. But uh, the, only, the only way to decide that for sure would be if we had only one correct cosmological model in which space would be infinite. From a cosmological point of view. But I personally do not like classifying which question belongs to which science. We should we should be aggressive with respect to science. If, even if it seems to be a metaphysical and we want to solve it scientifically, we should try to do it. We should be aggressive in, 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 in science. And, yeah. But even if you think that it is impossible for cosmology to solve that question, one should be aggressive to try to solve that which is impossible in cosmology? Because that presupposes that we can know that it's impossible. Uh, we, should, we should be aggressive always. Okay. <laughs> <laughs> well, <that's great. laughs> I was just curious, did, did Free Ray Bells write down the Cable's plus one model for just pure cosmological constant, no matter, just the, the, the sitter and the Cable's plus one, for it's just three spheres that you know contract and expand? I mean, then they wouldn't have had problems with They'd have a closed universe spatially, no singularity anywhere. So I'm curious at what state that was first written down. Well, it's just it's just the 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 cables plus one version of the center. Uh -huh. so, I'm not No, plus uh, the center with positive cosmological constant. Yeah. The thing that's a hyperboloid. The thing mm -hmm. that the, the radius goes as a hyperbolic cosine of of, yeah. of time. Yeah. But and that is, I mean, it fit the the, the assumptions of clones spatially, and it's non-singular for all times. Mm -hmm. So I, I'm just curious. When was that first written down and, and, and understood? This I don't know when it was written down. But if you look at all the solutions presented by uh, Friedman, right. there are such models. Yeah. Right, right. Yeah. Did, he ever, did he ever consider the limit of zero matter and just a pure no, cosmological constant? Friedman did not consider it because he had no time. Uh, because he died in 1975. Yeah. Yeah. Uh, by the way, once I discussed it after a small meeting with uh, some cosmologists, there was a dog that was present uh, at that meeting. And uh, I, I said a lot about the net, because I was the conversion. And I wanted to know something about Friedman, because at that time, uh, nobody not knew many things about Friedman. He was a very persona non grata in some of the Friedman. His two co workers, Bronstein and Edwin Friedrichsen, was Liquidated by some mm -hmm. and uh, yeah, and uh, I mm, uh, asked Zeldovic uh, about Friedman, and he uh, said only that that uh, look at the picture and the photograph of Friedman and Lemaitre. Lemaitre is a hard man, and he said, and look at, at Friedman, and you see that. The net was never hungry. <laughs> <laughs> and uh, Zerdovi said that another thing, that uh, Friedman was, had a chance that he died in 1925. And later on I learned that in fact his two his collaborators were related. Yeah. About this is just such a man. It would be a very interesting thing, by the way, to have a conference like that one, devoted not only to the match, but just to kind of comparison between the match and Friedman. Right. Uh, they were both parallel and anti-parallel people. They did almost the same. They had great interest in meteorology, both of them. The Lemaitre be because of the cosmic rays. And the uh, Friedman was a meteorologist. Both were connected somehow with radiation. So, so, so it would be very interesting. Well, that's plus 
responsibility for your book. Yeah. <laughs> if somebody wants to take the challenge on in the next three years. There's months. a very beautiful book about the day again from the best press about the life of the world. I don't know what happened to Paul Russian. I'm sure you've had a chapter on that. Well, yes. <laughs> well, that's a good chapter.